of, this of a firefighter. Will now be recorded. Keeps turning on off. I'm a firefighter there. Uh, I'm a captain at another organization, so I'm I'm trying my best to to answer to both, I guess. But uh, I am a firefighter for you guys, so I just want to make that clear. Um, I'm going to screen share now, and then just to verify everyone can see it, I'm only going to ask a couple of you if you can see it. So let me go ahead and do that. All right, Mr. Johnny May, are you able to see the PowerPoint presentation? Yeah, Mark, you look good. Okay, and uh, Mr. Barry, are you able to see the presentation? Yeah. All right. Well, without further ado, I guess we'll get started. Um, so your first chapter is going to be um, orientation to the fire service and fire service history, although I will admit I am a uh, aggressively militant history nut when it comes to the fire service. I think it's really important as we um, modernize our fire service and our workforce that we remember our roots um, dating back to millennia. And so this oftentimes is a chapter that's grazed over in academy. And um, I wanna be clear that the astute firefighter um, typically studies the history of the fire service to learn where we're going from where we've been. So um, some of the most respected firefighters in the nation, um, there's some big names out there who teach and lead and are really surrogates of the modern grassroots movement of the fire service today, are true historians of the, of the fire service. Um, I am none of those, but I, I try to do my best to really pay attention to what's occurred uh, really in the last hundred years. But um, for today's purposes, we're going to be going all the way back to 66 AD. So I hope you guys enjoy this. Um, so you're aware, I'm not able to see any of you while I'm giving this. So the, the chief and captain will kind of be moderating questions. Um, if you do have questions, try to text them. Um, and then Chief Bondas can kind of speak up to minimize confusion with the, the audio visual. Um, and we'll do our best to answer those. I'll also be giving a break. Uh, we're a little bit behind, so I'll probably go a little bit faster and then give you a break between my lesson and then the actual IPSTA lesson for about five or seven minutes. But feel free to ask questions at any point. And every several slides, I will ask if there are any questions. Uh, otherwise, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So uh, your first chapter is very short. I believe it's like 30 pages. Um, don't let the, the length of the chapter fool you though. It is intensive in the, the testing process. So if you have that IPSTA app, I highly encourage you to read that and test to that. It's a good practice to read the chapters ahead of class and try to test to get at least 80 or 90% on that application on your cell phone before you say you're good to go. And then you'll reconfirm that with the ISTA Moodles quizzes and uh, tests. So um, I've done my best to try to make my homegrown presentation actually very consistent with the questions on the test bank. So if you listen up, you're going to get a lot of a lot of good information in this. And then I've added asterisks and red text in the PowerPoint to any major question areas that will hopefully help you. So. Um, when you're reading the PowerPoint for study review, you can look back to those asterisks and those will give you some pointed information towards what you have to study on the test. Um, so if you think about uh, fire service, we typically think of the American fire service um, in, in the purview of us just being, being and working and living in the United States, but uh, the, the traditions of what used to be called and is still called town conflagration um, dates back to really before even known record in history. Um, this is a picture from what was called the Great Fire of Rome. Uh, it was 66 AD. The fire actually started in a, in a merchant's small little shop. And uh, as you can see in this picture at that time, there was no fire department to put out fires. Um, it ended up raging for six days. And uh, the way they actually stopped the fire was they tore down buildings to basically stop the spread. Um, without getting too detailed, if you imagine uh, New York City and it has its several boroughs, um, 
imagine Rome had its own boroughs and of the 14 boroughs of Rome at the time, the city of Rome, it burned uh, 10 of the 14 boroughs. So um, this was a significant time in history and you can research um, the great fire of Rome and kind of look at, at the significance of that. Um, there's no actual records of how many people died, but if you read some of the, the, the uh, notations by some philosophers from way back when, they said it was just epically destructive. This here is a picture a little bit more contemporary. This is uh, actually of the Great Fire of London. Uh, the Great Fire of London started September 2nd and waged for four years. Um, this was truly during the medieval times and um, fire service was actually around even in the 15 and 1600s. Uh, the most traditional term was called a fire brigade, which is uh, if you think about uh, Anglo-Saxon history, uh, even today, some of the more Eastern and more traditional fire departments in the United States refer to themselves as a fire brigade. In total, this fire um, burned down 13,200 houses and merchant shops, as well as 87 churches um, and major religious epic centers. Uh, the reports indicate that almost 80,000 people were displaced from their homes, um, but Ironically, there was only six deaths during the entire uh, town conflagration. So uh, just to put that in perspective, if you imagine the city of Denver, uh, imagine 80,000 people being displaced from, from a fire and what to do with them and where to put them, uh, created significant turmoil. And also in the, in the 17th century, really started the pendulum swinging to the right to modernize the fire service in Europe where we get our roots from. This is a picture from Philadelphia, although I'll be talking about several different things here. Um, if you go to your, your books later on, you'll be able to read a lot of the test questions will come from the initial history of uh, the American Fire Service. Um, so I'll speak a little bit about that. The, the first city to actually establish a legitimate uh, sanctioned fire department was Boston. Um, that was actually in 1963. However, before the fire department was established, they outlawed thatched roof construction, which was one of the first fire prevention methods in the United States to minimize structure fires and town conflagration. What they learned was from London and European countries that mainly had thatched roof construction. For those who don't know, take your leisure to Google it now, but it's hay bale constructed roof roofs. Um, they learned that the embers and uh, minimal fire would just wreak havoc on these highly combustible materials. And so uh, the United States, and at that time the colonies realized it was a, a major way to prevent fires um, instead of having to worry about putting them out. And we'll get back to fire prevention, which really circles back around in the 1980s. Um, shortly after, in 1735, um, probably what's the most iconic fire department was established and that's what really your textbook speaks about and that's the union volunteer fire department it's most notable because uh, that's actually where benjamin franklin was um they, they don't really say but uh the the story is he was the fire chief of that that organization it just says he kind of led it uh, but if you read do some research or research on it it, it kind of points towards him being the the fire chief um, it later became the Philadelphia Fire Department. So if you think about the major iconic and sentinel fire departments in the United States, Philadelphia is one of them with a, a steeped history dating back to well before uh, the Revolutionary War. Um, around the same time, uh, what used to be known as New Amsterdam in your book later became the city of New York. Uh, in 1937, New Amsterdam created their first fire department, which was all volunteer and then later mo modernized about 50 years later into a all career fire department, um, which became the fire department of New York or FDNY. Um, you can see here, this is a picture of a 17th century to 18th century leather bucket. Um, the term bucket brigade was, was legitimate because they would actually use one to two gallon leather buckets uh, at the bottom, they would either have clay or iron um, to minimize the, the buckets from burning on the ambers of the, the buildings that would burn down. 
even today, it's very iconic for uh, fire chiefs and longtime members of fire departments to receive leather buckets uh, as a commemorative item upon their retirement. Um, and that's truly just kind of a, a message back to our initial roots of who we were as firefighters and bucket brigades. So oftentimes you'll see um, almost like a trophy. It looks very similar to this, except it's elaborately painted. And sometimes they'll put leather shields on it, indicating the, the unit or the battalion or the district to which the member was retiring from, um, which uh, they're, they're really common to see that on the coastal states where they really hold tradition deep in their, their values. This is a picture of a, a pre-industrial revolution horse-drawn um, water pump. Uh, the reports say this was mid to late 19 or 1700s. Um, we'll be talking about the Industrial Revolution shortly, but prior to that uh, and the induction of uh, steam powered or steam pressurized pumps, um, this is how they would actually um, pressurize uh, basically a bellow system inside the hull of that, tr that trailer, which would create a minimal pressure for fire hose to uh, discharge on the fire. Um, you also notice there that you'll see at the top, there's a, a deck gun, which we now call a deluge. And at that time, firefighting techniques were truly defensive. Uh, most of the time, the firefighters would try to fight the fires really the only way possible, which was from the exterior of the structure. And they recognized that smoothbore nozzles, which is the very tip of that um, kind of what looks like a turret gun, uh, was the best option to get the most reach and distance out of the water that was being pressurized through the bellows system. In the 1800s, as we all know from middle school, we had the Industrial Revolution. Um, that was really the turning point for the uh, American states uh, to begin the initial kind of uh, modernization of, of the fire service as we know it today. Um, as we saw in the previous slide, when we had uh, all wood construction, trailer and sometimes man um, man drawn carriages they were they were switched uh, to horse drawn carriages that had steam powered pumps inside they began to carry ladders as well as uh, very basic rescue equipment in the 1800s um, some other changes occurred in the United States that really changed the way we fought fires namely uh, the introduction of iron and steel construction um, and we saw that in the coastal states, so New York, um, really the New England corridor, and then um, more of that colonial area began to build up instead of across. And so along with having to deal with five to seven story structures, we were now dealing with densely populated pockets of the United States where volunteer fire departments were no longer able to keep up with the call volume necessitating the need for career fire departments and uh, paid professional firefighters to continue carrying on the duties um, on a 24 seven basis. In 19, uh, 1896, um, you see here, this is the NFPA standard, at least the modern contemporary uh, emblem of the NFPA that stands for the National Fire Protection Association. Um, let me get through what they used to be and what they are, and then I'll talk about what they are now. Um, it was created in 1896. Uh, a, a, a test question for you is the first standard that they created with NFPA standard 13, and that was the standard for installation of sprinklers. Um, NFPA also was kind of the, the sister organization to the National Electric Code. So if anyone out there used to be or knows an electrician, they follow the NEC very closely. Um, they're, they're really the same company, just for different industries. What's important about the NFPA now is they are truly the national standard for literally everything in the fire service. Um, from the way we train to the way we uh, deploy tactics, to minimizing cancer, to telling building contractors how to actually construct sprinkler systems, uh, how to integrate um, exit and emergency um, kind of evacuation systems, the amount of time that building construction needs to be able to protect against fire, 
all the way to um, how we actually teach a class and how we report uh, emergency reports to the national uh, kind of entities all fall within the National Fire uh, Protection Association. Um, it's, it's in a way, it's kind of like our Bill of Rights and we usually choose to follow those. Timberline Fire is a good example of an organization that tries to abide by NFPA very closely. Um, as you get into the larger, more matured agencies like Denver Fire Department, West Metro, uh, Pooter Fire Authority, uh, they, they live and die by the NFPA standard, really due to a lot of politics as well as oversight um, to minimize risk and liability on the department and transfer that risk and liability to the NFPA. Um, for a lot of agencies that are more rural and have less um, less of a more uh, of a formal organizational structure, oftentimes they're they're hampered by following the NFPA standard because it's quite expensive and elaborate to abide by it. Um, a good example of that is the NFPA requires certain amounts of personnel to respond to structure fires and for organizations to say they're NFPA compliant with the amount of people they respond to structure fires with takes a lot of money to pay for the staffing to run a career agency. And you can see a problem there if, if it's a small rural organization that runs 60 calls a year, uh, they probably don't have the tax basis to be able to pay for 20 firefighters to be 24 seven. And uh, there's multitudes of different examples with everything from cancer mit mit uh, mitigation to how a fire engine is built. And some or organizations simply can't afford to be within compliance of the NFPA. Um, so you're in a really good place that Timberline Fire uh, really does a lot of good, especially for being a, a rural mountain organization to abide by a lot of the standards and procedures that NFPA requires. Do we have any questions up to this point? Uh, no question. Sorry, this is Callie. I had to run and go and run a call, so I just didn't get a chance to introduce myself. You go, girl. Okay. Well, while you're while you're there, why don't you give us a quick wrap on who you are? Uh, where you live, why you want to be a firefighter, and uh, and uh, and what you want out of the academy. All right, sorry, sorry to uh, disrupt the lecture, but like I said, I'm Callie. Um, I work for AMR Golden right now, so I'm on shift at the current moment. So had to go on a call. Um, I've been doing this for nine years now. Um, and just kind of wanted to go into the fire service, decided this maybe two years ago. So figured volunteering was a good place to start. Um, super excited for the academy and was even more excited for the online. So I didn't have to do as many ship trades um, and just excited for what this academy has to offer. Cool. Well, yeah. Nice to meet you. Thanks for, thanks for coming back and we understand you're running calls. <laughs> trying to balance everything so sure all right all right we'll continue um in your book and again like i said i'm trying to do this podcast style so you don't necessarily need to follow along in your book if you go to page um 12 if you if you so fancy that uh you'll see a bunch of bullet points there with significant fires in the history of the united states so i'm going to cover a couple of those um, I'm only going to do two of those, so you can see there's uh, seven or eight there. I really encourage you to memorize the, the fire's name, the location, and some major takeaways like what, what that was, why it was such a remarkable fire, because those are very pertinent questions on your test. <clears throat> so this is the Iroquois Theater Fire. Um, you can read in your, your book there. Uh, this occurred in Chicago. Uh, it was 1903, which was also the year the Springfield 1903 rifle came out, which was an epic sniper's rifle in 2000 or in World War II. Um, even till today, it's, it's the deadliest single structure fire in US history. It killed 602 people and injured an additional 250. Um, the fire, the reason this was so so remarkable was 
if you look at the picture there, this is a, a typical brownstone style arrangement, which means they have your major thoroughfare and entry and exit on the front with no, no major exits on the left or right side, which you'll learn later, but we call that the Bravo and, and Delta side. That's the left and right side, respectfully, with probably just service hatches or service doors on the rear, which we call the Charlie side. And so because of that, um, and, and in addition to that, um, the hardware on the actual door handles was very or very traditional in a sense it was like a claw or a, a, just a twist knob handle. Um, if you can imagine thousands of people trying to exit a, a single way in and out in a large theater is nearly impossible. And that was the demise for the 602 that fell during that fire. Um, this was remarkable because the uh, NFPA updated um, construction laws to require panic hardware on certain occupancy types, in this case, major assemblies. And so that's an example of how the test questions may be presented to you. And so you need to kind of memorize um, the name of the fire, the location, uh, the date, and then the big remarkable outcome from it. Here's a picture from inside, so you can imagine a thousand people trying to evacuate out of a single area. If you look at the group of people congregating on the um, platform there and then look up or to the 12 o'clock position of your screen, you'll see an example of the service door that goes out to the back of the, um, of the main performance area. Nobody was able to get out that way. And that's, that's part of the demise of the situation. The next fire we'll talk about just briefly is the Coconut Grove fire. Uh, this occurred in late November of uh, 1942. Um, it occurred in Boston, Massachusetts and killed 492 people. Uh, it was actually such a pivotal structure fire that it took over the major headlines of the newspapers and of the radio networks, uh, even from the, from, the war, from the war efforts because of the destruction it caused. Um, much like the previous Iroquois fire, um, this also had to do with uh, really not paying attention and being mindful of combustible surfaces and finishes inside of the building. And so one of the major remarkable outcomes from this fire was, um, A, they determined that combustible uh, finishes need to be uh, standardized as well as have some national oversight. So the NFPA um, added additional um, standards to building construction as well as finishing standards for uh, people who were putting putting things inside these buildings but it wasn't until the 1980s and even the 1990s that a lot of um, businesses actually started abiding by code and code enforcement until the fire service opted and chose to be more um, more stern with their enforcement efforts I love this photo. Um, it, it represents a lot to me being a veteran and uh, and really holding true to my military past. I know. Uh, let's see, we've got uh, we've got Scott, who's also in the military. Um, 1946, the war basically dwindled down. Well, it was 1945, but in 46, a lot of soldiers and service members started to return home from the war and uh, the economy was doing great with the military machine. And so um, it was very easy for uh, military members to find a, a conduit of that same kinship and brotherhood that they had in the military and on the front lines uh, in, the, in the first response community. So a lot of uh, veterans took up uh, law enforcement as well as the fire service. Um, it's also important because uh, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but with the major wars uh, that occur, you get spikes of military tradition that go in and out or ebb and flow with the military culture kind of leaking into the fire service. And so after World War II, um, there was a lot of military tradition that was rekindled in the fire service uh, where we kind of get our term of paramilitary structure really comes from that philosophy dating back to even the Revolutionary War, uh, World War I, World War II, Vietnam, and now the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. Um, you have a lot of that coming back in, which in, it kind of uh, ebbs and flows, like I said, some of that culture 
that we know from the fire service and the military in a lot of similar ways. Here's a picture from uh, the West Coast. This was, uh, the best I can find was from the 1950s, uh, again, with the West Coast. Take note in the uniforms they're wearing, because um, I'll come back to that later. You can see the iconic leather helmet on top. Um, <clears throat> the jackets at that time were um, actually not rubber. They were denim that was impregnated with a rubber surface or a coating. And then they would typically wore your uh, vanilla Levi or um, Wrangler like 500 denim jeans. Um, that was that was actually all they wore. So they had no SCBAs. They had no uh, bunker jackets or bunker coats as we know today. And you notice down below their boots. Um, those are just thigh high boots. I'll show you another picture in a few moments. But that was kind of the iconic image of firefighters that we think of today when we close our eyes and look back at the black and white photos. Also, if you look at the background, you'll see a dude that looks like he's got some really weird haircut with half a bald head, or maybe he's got a beret on, I can't really tell. Um, but it's kind of cool to look at his ladder there. That's a 20 foot straight section ladder. Um, and I just wanted to make mention that uh, those ladders are still in use today by a lot of West Coast fire departments namely uh, Los Angeles and San Francisco. They're two of the last fire departments in the United States um, who still keep and service fire ladders made out of hickory dating back to the 1960s and 70s. A lot of the ladders are the original ladders um, that have just been um, basically refurbished every three years. Uh, it's pretty remarkable that they still have an in service and that just really goes to show that they take their tradition very, um, very near and dear to their heart albeit the ladders weigh about 50% more than the modern all aluminum constructed ladders that we use at Timberline Fire today. Uh, this is one of the most iconic pictures. Uh, and for me, this is probably one of the most impactful photos of the, tonight's presentation. Um, this photo, as you can tell by the uh, acronym there, FDNY Ladder 31, um, the way that FDNY says that they actually say 31 ladder, uh, this was taken in the 1970s. I couldn't find the exact date of the photo. Uh, this was during the war years, as it was known, um, really immediately. And this was a very important time in the United States Fire Service. If you think back to the 1960s uh, with the civil rights movement, misogyny, political unrest, um, a lot of the uh, inadequacies of, of our nation at that time, it kind of um, capitulated in New York City in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, after World War II, a lot of people came home and um, started families. And um, because of that, a lot of what we now know as project living was built in a lot of uh, fairly busy metropolitan areas. And <clears throat> as the civil rights movement kind of continued, with that came poverty, drug use, and a lot of the dark spots that we think of in our American history when it relates to the 1960s and 70s. It was very easy for somebody who had a family of four that was living in awful conditions to set fire to their house to make an insurance claim or to be uh, removed and replaced in a new living situation by the government. And that was only one of several different reasons why structure fires were so significant at that time. Uh, additionally, uh, if you think about gingification, as we know it today, uh, a lot of the more um, affluent people moved out of the cities and into the suburbs, and a lot of the less uh, fortunate and poverty-stricken um, cohorts of people moved into the city. Um, I was trying to find a photo, but I, I couldn't. In the 1950s and 60s, if you look at the end or the truck there, the cab, it was very common for those to be convertible style or open top. Uh, when the war years kicked off, um, the FDNY actually had to retrofit all of their open top engines with steel plating uh, because people were throwing Molotov cocktails inside the cab. Uh, and that didn't just happen once, that wasn't an outlier or an anomaly, that was a daily occurrence. In fact, several uh, of the fire stations inside more of the deep um, war areas, if you will, 
um, it wasn't uncommon to have concertina wire as well as um, grating put over the windows to protect them from Molotov cocktails as well as gunfire. It was truly a, a horrible time for the United States, but out of that, uh, the firefighters that fought during that time saw the most significant fire duty in U.S. history. Um, in fact, it was 1978 uh, was the deadliest year for uh, fatalities due to structure fires. Uh, that year alone, 7,710 people died. Um, just to kind of give you that, that number in comparison to 2018, uh, we lost 3,600 people in, in 2018. So basically a doubling of, of fire deaths. Um, I'd encourage you guys all after Academy or if you have enough uh, bandwidth to do it now to read the book by Dennis Smith, S-M-I-T-H, uh, Report from Engine 82. Um, I encourage that to be one of your first books to read outside of the Fire Academy because it really galvanizes where we came from in the mid 1970s and 1980s, especially on the Eastern coast and how that impacts us moving forward.